Well, yeah, thanks so much to Herplus Data for having me this evening. I'm really excited to talk to you about why your data is exclusionary. And to kick it off, I'll just tell you a bit about myself. So I'm Rima. I founded People of Data. I'm incredibly passionate about data, which hopefully you'll come to learn over the next 20 minutes. I have worked at big companies and small companies, kind of revolutionizing the way that these companies look at their data, I've been invited to uh, conference stages across the world to talk about these uh, successes and the challenges too. But the thing I don't often talk about on these stages is how incredibly frustrated I am with the way that some organizations collect my data and it feels as though they're not really representing me and you know the complex life that I have. So I have the feeling that other people also get that same feeling too. I quit my job this year so that I can start my company, People of Data. People of Data is all about bringing the stories through of individuals like myself, like yourselves, so that we can really share our stories using data to create impact and inclusion when we are sharing our information. So we're going to talk about three things today, how great data is. We're at the Her Plus Data event. So hopefully you all agree that data is great, but if not, then I'll, I'll just add a bit more to that story. We'll then talk about why it's exclusionary. And of course, I'm not going to leave you on a, on a cliffhanger. We'll talk then about what we can actually do about this too. So I've lived in Leeds and West Yorkshire for the last 10 years or so, but this year I moved to Edinburgh. This isn't what it looks like all the time, but it is certainly very beautiful when it does. And as part of this move, I've had to change and update a lot of my data in terms of, you know, my bank address, my uh, driving license, even all the way down to these things such as like, which supermarket am I gonna to go to now? So the closest one to me is a Lidl and it's not my favorite one. I do prefer an Audi, but I'm happy to kind of go with whatever's convenient. And as soon as you walk into Lidl, you see the advert that they have for their app. So I'm walking around Lidl thinking about how, okay, this is an Aldi and it's not, the things aren't where I would expect them to be, but it's all fine. I kind of can move past that eventually to then think about, do I actually want this app? Like I, I know about supermarkets and how they collect this information so that they can understand us as uh, customers better. But as I walk around and I'm like, you know, thinking about, do I want these vouchers or not that are on this app? I sign up um, and ultimately kind of all I really want are these coupons. They say that they're gonna give a free bakery coupon. So I guess that's the reason, that's the hook. They got me, they got me with that. And so ultimately though, the thing is, is I don't think everyone looks at Lidl as being a data company, but I would say that Lidl is a data company. I think probably actually that all of the supermarkets in, in some way are a data company. And to kind of amplify that out, I see that data is just information. So all companies and organizations really have data so I'm then going to de uh, deduce that like all companies actually are data companies. So to organizations, we probably are just data points in, in one way. Hopefully organizations are see, see us as more than data points, but ultimately we go around uh, whether it's the digital footprint that we're leaving behind in terms of what did we buy um, or, you know, when we go to the GP, what you know, when did we have an appointment and, and all of the information about our health as well. There's also the offline data. For example, I can go on the bus and I can pay with change. There's no digital transaction related to that from my perspective, but the bus company will still have a lot of information about who has purchased tickets uh, or, you know, how many tickets have been purchased as well. So I think that data is way more than spreadsheets and charts. And for, for all of the people probably outside this community who think that data is scary and that data is something that they can't do because they're not good at maths, I just want to challenge that assumption and tell people that data is way, way more than spreadsheets and charts. There's so, so much more to it. I believe that it's a place to have an adventure, which again, probably not everyone's perception around data. But I think the thing is, is that we start at this point A, thinking about what, what are we trying to find? What do we have available to us? What, what are we trying to, to get to as an output? And we'll go through this adventure, kind of exploring the data that we have, 
probably turning back on ourselves because we realized that actually that thing that we were looking at half an hour ago that didn't seem so interesting is actually incredibly interesting and really important. We'll also end up down some rabbit holes as well. But ultimately, we kind of end up at this point B, which is somewhere where we've understood something that we previously didn't know, even if that outcome is actually there's nothing good here to see. But data can provide insights from back to the little example. It's important there to understand actually what a shop is doing. There's an opportunity to say, OK, this is going really well. We're selling loads of this product. How do we do more of that? By the same token, we can say we thought that we would sell a lot more of this product. Why are we not? And there's an opportunity to kind of change strategy. And all of this comes then through storytelling. Storytelling is incredibly important, and I really don't think that we can do it without data. Like I say, I think that data is just information. So any information that we put into a story ultimately feels to me like data. So hopefully uh, after the first few minutes here that we're all on the same page that data is great. I think that it is a really exciting space to be working in, but also really cool that we get to interact with it, even if sometimes we're not aware that we're directly interacting with data. And we're not, I'm not the only one person who thinks data is great. So there's studies out there that show that data-driven companies are 19, more ty 19 times more likely to be profitable. So this means that we should be doing more with our data because ultimately we can kind of hit our goals in theory in a better way. But it doesn't seem to be a priority for everyone. It seems as though even though that we know data is a great thing and data can provide use to our organizations, the this study here that was done that says that only kind of 20.6 of the FTSE 1000 organizations have established a data culture feels to me that there's just a missed opportunity there. And I'm kind of wondering why. I wonder why, even though we know data is great and there's good things we can do about it, that people just aren't doing the good stuff. And I think the thing is, it probably comes down to a couple of things. Um, some stuff like time. Time is a challenging one. So I'll tell another story here. Relating back to me moving to Edinburgh is... I lived in Leeds for 10 years. There's a whole load of my data that exists there that is relating to the fact that that's where I was living. And for a little stint there, I also stayed at my parents' house before moving to Edinburgh. When I was staying at my parents' house, I had a, um, a, an eye test. And so that's all normal, all good. And so over the last couple of months, what has happened uh, multiple times, I've had an email from the opticians to say, you're due an eye test. I guess they've got something automated there that's saying, you know, it's been X amount of time, you're ready to come back. And as much as I probably should have unsubscribed from that email, because it's annoying me clearly enough to put it in a talk, that I am just kind of curious as to why the organization who's sending me that email hasn't stopped to think, okay, does this person even still live here? Does this person, have they gone to another provider? It's actually free to get eye test in Scotland, which is great. I could still go to that same organization here, but decided to go to the one that's way more convenient because it's just at the end of the road. So all of this here in terms of time and kind of strategy around how we're collecting data feels to me like the challenge. But the thing that I really want to hone in on is the fact that we collect data in way more forms than just kind of interactions and transactions. Diversity and inclusion forms don't make me feel included. For the 10 years that I spent being in Leeds, there were certain things around my protected characteristics that if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have answered that question and answer form in one way, but now I'm asking, answering those questions in a completely different way. So when you ask me these questions on this form that are meant to make me feel included as part of your community or organization or initiative, actually it's doing the opposite because there's no opportunity for me to go back and actually update that information that I previously gave you. It might be fine to think about the fact that that data was captured at a snapshot in time, but I've worked in companies, uh, being a data analyst, being a data engineer, being these hands-on technical roles, where there's been 
a lot of assumptions made and a lot of drawing conclusions. And, and I get that's kind of part of the role. But the thing that I feel is that when we take a big customer database that has got loads and loads of information, sometimes the, the data that's come from these diversity and inclusion forms too, there's a lot of roll up and build up that says, this is what our customer database looks like now. But if that data is even like six months, a year old, or it could actually have just been collected a couple of weeks ago, there's the likelihood that that data could have changed. So data can provide insights. It can give you the opportunity to see things that otherwise you wouldn't have known and all through the power of storytelling. But me as an individual, have, having worked in data and having understood how some of the systems work, but also as this other person over here who has my whole life and the way that it's gone so far and the way that it will continue to go as well, I don't always feel like I want to hand over my data to companies. So how does that really look from an organization's perspective? Like, are they really able to draw the level of insight that they were planning to get out of that? Do they get to, to understand the opportunities in the same way? And are those stories really as powerful and impactful as they could be, given that half of the data, or you know, not necessarily half, but some of the data they're collecting isn't necessarily telling the whole truth? I think for me, this talk is this talk is titled Why is your data exclusionary? And for me, what that means is it's this lack of choice to kind of give my data over. Sometimes you just have to hand it over if you want to use a service. I also feel frustrated that it's not as easy as I want it to be to change or update my data. I, like I say, in my move from Leeds all the way up to Edinburgh, there's so much of my data that's still going to be connected with the fact that I used to live there. But that's not right. Like it's not correct information anymore. And it's probably not useful to the organization in the same way that that trail that I left behind isn't useful to me. If we're going to productize people by using their data to offer free services so that we can sell them something, I think that we should do better in trying to understand how we're actually using data. So when we talk about why it's not a priority for organizations to use data, how do we also add in that extra layer that you're not using data and you're probably also not thinking about how it's impacting the individual that you're collecting, whatever little data you are um, collecting. So this is why I started People of Data, and this is absolutely not a sales pitch, I promise. This is me telling you that I've worked in data for multiple years, and I'm just exhausted with the way that I see organizations collecting and using data. So I set People of Data up so that I could provide education to show people why this is even a problem or something that they should care about, and then to create some consultancy to help them to do better with their data and really get to those stories that help them to maximize the impact and inclusion that they can create using data. So I'm super excited to show this, uh, the People of Data Playbook, nice shiny title. I have created this six step framework, which allows us to kind of go through and say, why don't we just start off with understanding what data are you collecting now? And we'll go through steps one and two in a bit more detail, but to understand what are you doing right now, to then go through and examine why. Like, why are you doing it that way? And I think that answer that often comes out, which is, we've always done it this way. That is the time to kind of leave that behind and actually to start critically challenging and examining why we're doing things this way. To then go through and imagine what could the future look like if we had whatever data we needed and had whatever data collection systems we needed, and we could get the data on a day-to-day -day basis at the frequency that we needed, what could we actually do? So that's the time to really dream big. And then to plan on how do we start to add value from these things that we've identified that would be great without spending you know, two to three years on a project that we're not even sure is really gonna work. We then go into actually delivering and Throughout that is constantly kind of looking and checking that we're, you know, does this plan still work? Because things will change. We don't work in a vacuum, so things are constantly evolving. And the last step here, arguably, arguably 
the most important is to kind of go through and evaluate and constantly evaluate. Does this still make sense? Have we achieved the things that we want to? And none of this is a, you know, this is not a one-time process. This is a constant thing that I believe we need to do because like I say, the world is not existing in a vacuum. Things are constantly changing. As I've described to you with myself, I've evolved. I'm sure that you all have too. So it's about constantly going through. So what we'll do is just go through steps one and two, and then I'll leave you with a couple of things that from today, you should be able to do not just only in your jobs, but also when you're walking around is just being a bit more critical in terms of how you think about data. So the first step, in terms of auditing data, these questions on the surface are very simple, but as you get into an organization where there's loads of different systems, loads of different stakeholders, it can take some time. But just starting off with like, what data do you collect? Where do you collect it from? How do you collect it? How frequently are you collecting it as well in terms of when do you collect it? And probably one of the most important questions is why do you collect it? If you don't understand the context of why that data is there, I think you can lose a lot of meaning from it. So the next thing then is to examine the purpose. So this really is just rephrasing that question why, but breaking it out into a few different ways. So understanding what do you uh, what understanding do you get from this data? Why do you collect it? When do you review the data? I think that one's a really critical one because understanding, you know, are you looking at this data on a monthly basis or a weekly basis kind of tells a different story as to how you should present that data, how you should collect it and those sorts of things. And then also thinking about where do we go to see it? Some people get reports directly into their inbox. Others get it because they go to a dashboard and they're kind of self-serving. Again, these, these questions really help us to build up that picture. And ultimately, the thing is, is that an organization exists because it has some, um, you know, big goals that exist across the whole company. Each team might have smaller goals, but the whole question really is how does the data that you're collecting and using support you in achieving this goal so kind of using these things then to come back into the playbook the next part is then to imagine and think about like where could you get to if you could use this data in any way and like i say then plan to deliver that in a way that you can get value almost immediately in some cases other times it might take slightly longer to then deliver that and like I say, constantly evaluate so that we can improve the processes that we're using. So from today, what can you do? The, the playbook might take a little bit longer, but these three things I absolutely promise you, you can do today and probably as soon as you go outside and walk down the street. So a thing that I do all the time, uh, which is annoying to some people, <laughs> but it is to constantly ask why. If some data is being collected, then I'm normally asking the question, why? Why are you collecting this data? What are you gonna do with it? And you know, we all know about GDPR and that ultimately we're legally obliged to say why we have data, but I think that's still a really important question to ask. Mm -hmm. Equally as important to ask, if not more important, is why not? Like, why should you not collect this data? Because actually, especially when it comes to those diversity and inclusion forms, sometimes that's how we're getting into the space where we're introducing bias where if we hadn't asked those questions at all we wouldn't have known and we couldn't we wouldn't have given like you know some ai or machine learning or even just ourselves in an excel file the opportunity to introduce that bias there so we should regularly challenge what we're doing with data and the way that we approach it in terms of the collection in terms of the processing analyzing and the presenting of it too and this story here in terms of the times that I've been a data engineer or analyst being sat with someone and doing some pair programming, those points of time create a little bit of friction where you can kind of ask someone, but why have you just, why have you just done that there? And the person next to you is saying, well, it's just, it's just obvious, isn't it? I've just assumed that like, this is the case. But the thing that we should do is assume with caution, because I think it's really easy to let those assumptions slip in. We are innately in our species, 
like really good at quickly understanding is there a danger around so the assumptions that we make are incredibly important but also they can be incredibly dangerous so i just encourage you all to be cautious when you assume so this is the last part. I just wanted to say that I honestly believe that we're all people of data in some form. Our data exists in masses of volumes and we don't seem to have so much control over it all the time. But I think it's possible for us to make change through challenging the systems, the way that they exist and the way that we interact with them as well. So that's me. Thank you. <laughs>